they're getting lighter, Megan, but they're getting fatter. What's up, guys? Derek, more place more dates.com. Today, we are talking about semaglutide, terzepatide, GLP 1 agonist, dual GIP and GLP 1 receptor agonist, as well, which is the terzepatide Monjaro. You guys might be more familiar with the brand names of Ozempic and Wegovy for semaglutide dosage incremental variants or. Monjaro for terzepatide. And then there are other more, I don't know, lesser known GLP-1 agonists that are more uh, ancient, I guess, at this point, like uh, liraglutide, dulaglutide, which are all falling into the class of GLP-1 receptor agonists. And then terzepatide is a dual receptor agonist that has a bit of a different mechanism of action. But overall, the net outcome of these compounds is going to be appetite suppression. At the end of the day, that's what a lot of people who are using this stuff are using it for and is why it has gotten so much hype is it is a dramatic weight loss enhancing drug essentially and you have the likes of the kardashians supposedly are using it and then even elon musk seemingly being heavily endorsing of it not long ago had his physique looking like this and it got a lot of scrutiny online never in my life have i seen a physique like this went viral um, a lot of people talking about his physique and how he's uh out of shape etc comparing him to bezos who's fucking sauced up and it's kind of hard to compete with that guy right so and i don't know how much elon cares has cared historical historically about body composition or how much he cares now proportionally to before and why if he's just becoming more more aware of his uh you know impending early mortality if he doesn't get his body composition in check but he has even revealed on uh the full send podcast he just get in a proper routine wild enough for a guy who is this successful to make it seem like he doesn't really have a dialed in routine whatsoever he goes to bed at like 3 a.m gets up after like six and a half hours and he says he picks up his phone is the first thing he does when he wakes up instead of working out and he needs to start working out more says here like i gotta work out and be in better shape you know mm -hmm. um so um yeah, we need you around oh uh, thanks i i actually don't really like working out but um I, I gotta do it so i'm gonna switch from you know just immediately looking at my phone first thing in the morning as soon as i wake up to I don't know, it's working out for at least 20 minutes. And then like you would never fucking guess this is a like the you know richest person on the planet, essentially saying this exact sentence he just said. Like it sounds like a guy who does not have his shit together whatsoever, which obviously he does. But I mean, like everyone has their own shortcomings, you know, at the end of the day, even guys like this. <laughs> have you ever tried pre-workout? And then fucking Kyle comes in with the golden suggestion. Have you ever tried pre-workout? Like, what's a pre-workout? It's. Like I actually did a video on this part where, you know, Kyle then goes on to tell Elon that he should dry scoop pre-workout is the first thing he does when he wakes up. So then he is redlined, <laughs> has no choice but to go to the gym, which is actually kind of comical. But anyways, Elon's reaction is pretty hilarious too. So after that, I don't know if at that time he was already on it, but October of last year, somebody tweets out, hey, Elon, what's your secret? You look awesome, fit, ripped, and healthy. Lifting weights, eating healthy. And Elon's response is none of the above, essentially. It's basically not eating and using a drug that makes me not hate not eating. Wegovy. I hope that came out right. Makes me take a drug that makes me not hate not eating. So many, you know, double negatives can, you know, fuck me up. So anyway, he goes from looking like this to looking a bit more, you know, slim and slender and leaned out in the face and just a little bit better overall, for sure. Like a noticeable change and looks like, a, you know, he's becoming healthier and taking it more seriously finally. Here, I think this was when he uh, first came into Twitter looking better than he has in the past, for sure. He's had some much rougher looks, absolutely. I don't wanna go through like a catalog of his body composition, but this is like one of his best looks in a while as far as I know. Recently, Zuby Music was featured on GB News saying, I wish people would stop looking for magic and shortcuts. Losing weight is not easy, but it's simple. Rapper Zuby shares his thoughts on new weight loss jab being prescribed to healthy people by online pharmacies. Elon responds. He's like, dude, it actually works. He is obviously somebody who has benefited highly from it from a net weight loss perspective. Objectively, the guy has got pretty significant results and is heavily endorsing of it to the point where he literally attributes the results that he has to, again, like I said a second ago, not eating and using a drug that enhances his ability to not eat 
And again, you could argue that is prolonging his eating window or whatever you want to say with fasting. Could be, you know, a net reduction in calories or whatever it is. You know, some people will actually fast for days on end without eating. For him, presumably it is something like an intermittent fast, which condenses his eating window to a point where not only is it very difficult for him to overeat to the point that he did before because he has a more condensed eating window, but in addition to that, the drug that uh, slows down gastric emptying and enhances feelings of fullness and satiety, etc., is going to make it even harder above and beyond that. Like you reach satiation much easier and you're far more likely to just cut yourself off and not give into the, you know, the cravings, the binge eating, etc. So for him, it's working. And whenever he's asked about it, he chimes in and says what it is, gives it, you know, its props and is heavily endorsing of it. So there are celebrities that are quite happy with what it did for them. And expectedly, they speak, the ones that are candid about what they're doing have pretty glowing reviews and it essentially does not go further than that because they again even Elon as intelligent and educated as he is when it comes to something that is not your field of expertise you are really not going to know a whole lot more than you know or have gone out of your way to know and for him and many others, I am sure if they had full context on the gravity of impact this stuff could have on your health status in a not totally obscenely positive manner and there are actual negative side effects to it he may otherwise have a more balanced take when he goes about just dropping tweets that could otherwise influence millions of people to just start haphazardly taking the shit now am i is this to say that i am not somebody who thinks it has applications no i you know i've talked about this drug for years at this point i think i was you know well before the craze kind of like took off and i've seen how effective it can be in applications, I think it is absolutely warranted in. It's actually pretty helpful for a lot of people. I think the net outcome is a significant positive. However, one of the things that goes overlooked, there are two main things I want to talk about in this video, side effect profile wise, that a lot of people don't talk about. Ultimately, people talk about the nausea, GI distress, diarrhea, you know, potentially even vomiting in a minority of cases too. Like this stuff is going to be stressful on the GI. Like some people can't tolerate it at all. Some people have, you know, an adaptation period. And one of the problems or benefits, it's kind of like a backhanded negative of the positive is the pharmacokinetic profile. Adherence to this drug is much higher because it has a once a week injection schedule. So it will take literally one pin a week and you have this stuff peaked in your system within five weeks once it's achieved steady state concentrations. However, that also means that if you encounter GI distress or significant side effects, it is going to take much longer to work its way out of your system and get those side effects out of your system because of the half-life itself. So this enhances adherence, but it also is a detriment if you are somebody who experiences side effects. But above and beyond that, it actually has some of the negative downsides that come across exactly the same that we see in androgen users in testosterone replacement therapy it's going to be a directly relevant contrasting of bolus dosing enhancing side effects and exacerbating them to a point that could otherwise be potentially avoidable which is something that is worth mentioning briefly is it shocking to me that well it's not shocking but these things force you to inject the full weekly dosage in one shot essentially so you have a wego v pen 2.4 milligram increment of semaglutide for obesity management 2.4 milligrams you do not get to choose how much gets injected into you once you work your way up to the 2.4 milligram increment it is one shot one kill that's the deal you are using the whole thing or you're not fucking using it this thing comes out with such aggressive velocity to shoot into your system with this auto injector you are not doing less you're not going to be able to manipulate anything you either use the max dose in the pen or you choose a different pen entirely and stick to that one. So you cannot actually, even if your weekly dose is 2.4 milligrams, it would be more ideal probably <laughs> to administer on a every three day cadence, every two day cadence, or ideally on like an everyday cadence potentially, if you wanted to attenuate some of these side effects similar to, you know, a bolus dose of testosterone not being representative of endogenous production whatsoever. If you shoot once a week, you have this giant fucking spike in test and then significant amounts of aromatization, 5-alpha reduction, etc. And the exacerbated side effect profile that comes as a result of that, the same thing will happen with GLP-1 receptor agonism. And when you have a giant bolus in one shot once a week, you can imagine the same kind of shit's going to happen just in a different mechanism because it's a different drug with different interactions and GLP-1 receptors are not meant to be 
hammered like once a week in some mega fucking quantity. So, you know, it sucks. And I do see why compounding may otherwise be a more viable alternative, actually, for people who are trying to attenuate the side effect burden that is essentially, if you are prone to it, unavoidable with the single dose administration patterns that come from these, you know, Wegovy or Terzepatide dosages. Imagine being forced to shoot a 15 milligram Manjaro pen like once a week. Now, some people will tolerate it, obviously, a fair bit of people, but you can just imagine what kind of a better net outcome you could get from a results perspective with a relative lack of side effects to achieve those results if you could actually use it in a more distributed manner, I would assume. But it's interesting and I can understand why it is done in this manner too, but that's kind of besides the point. The two main side effects I want to talk about that are notable and go overlooked, in my opinion, are the changes in resting heart rate and also the this is becoming more prevalent and discussed is the effect it has on lean body mass because what we do see is a basically huge endorsement of the drug because of a satisfaction with overall weight loss like elon has clearly lost a lot of weight now is the outcome of the weight loss generally going to be a positive thing for hemoglobin a1c metrics fasting glucose etc etc Yes, you are going to see improvements in biomarkers when you lose weight. However, there are certain individuals that have a disproportionate loss in muscle, even bone in some cases too, and it essentially goes overlooked because the actual target endpoints in these studies, they are looking at net weight loss outcomes, not necessarily lean body mass relative to fat mass relative to like, this is not something that is segregated in a way that is representative of good versus bad weight loss. It is just what is the outcome. And that is a more dramatic headline, obviously, too. If you know, you're a pharma company who's trying to highlight how potent your stuff is, you want to show the total amount of pounds lost you don't care if it's <laughs> where it's coming from necessarily as much when you're just trying to beat, you know, the other pharmaceutical company that has a certain amount of pounds lost. You don't give a shit, really. As long as you lost more pounds than them, you are going to get more hype, more uh, glamorization in the media, more uh, overall sales and money and revenue. So one of the people who is most outspoken about this is uh, Peter Atia. He has gone on uh, Megyn Kelly's show, as well as talked about it on The Drive, his own personal podcast, as well as elsewhere. He's actually the one who made me go check some of my old uh, heart rate metrics to actually see this change myself personally and kind of confirm, because I've tried, candidly, I've experimented with GLP-1 agonists in the past as well. And I did actually notice myself a bump five to 10 beats per minute in my heart rate when I used it, which is pretty sketchy. And we'll get into why that happens and why it's very concerning in my opinion shortly. But this is what he said on the Megyn Kelly show about what he's seeing in lean body mass metric, basically what the net outcome is in his patients that are using this. When we're putting patients on these drugs, we're doing DEXA scans before and after. This is something the FDA did not require the company to do when they sought approval. We're seeing two thirds of the weight loss is lean mass. Only one third wow. is fat mass. So keep in mind, when you hear those stats too, a lot of the people who are using these drugs and are getting prescribed them are people who have lost, you know, 20, 30 plus pounds, like 15, 20% of their body mass entirely is what some of these study metrics are showing being lost. And when you factor in how much of that is lean mass, metabolically active tissue, helpful tissue versus actual fat mass that you're trying to get rid of in a targeted manner, ideally, the net outcome of it being a proportionally higher loss of the tissue that is otherwise sought after and makes you more capable of avoiding the negative ramifications of any sort of presence of, you know, the, the bad mass, ultimately losing muscle or bone. These are not necessarily good things in natural, not you know, mega enhanced bodybuilder populations. Wow. So they're getting lighter, Megan, but they're getting fatter. So basically they're becoming skinny fat, which in individuals who are 
already basically showing that they do not necessarily have the healthiest relationship with food to have reached some sort of body composition that is representative of something that is a viable candidate for a obesity management drug that is like the most nuclear approach you could be using essentially you can see how this could be a slippery slope and a vicious circle which i'll do my best to elucidate shortly but here is a graphical representation of terzepatide versus wegovy in efficacy metrics so we see here terzepatide at five milligrams 10 milligrams and 15 basically you you have five milligrams producing and slightly edging out the max dose of semaglutide for obesity management. We have the 2.4 milligram Wegovy pen basically hitting the same 15% weight loss metric as terzepatide, five milligrams. However, it seems that the side effect burden of terzepatide is also lower as well. So terzepatide in general just seems to be a superior drug. And I think a lot of people are going to realize this in the coming years. It is just something that has not got as much media hype because, you know, semaglutide is the one that Elon's on. It's the one that, you know, the Kardashians hyped up apparently. And it just has the most media attention essentially. But as a actual drug, having something that is hitting multiple vectors in a more balanced way that isn't as aggressively focused on one receptor agonism to the max of one thing versus having a more balanced approach of different MOAs seems to be similar to any drug stack, even like in a bodybuilding context, typically you're going to have a better result when you have a smaller, more tolerable combination of compounds that do different things or achieve similar outcomes, but without having a hammering of one mechanism of action. Rather, you have two complementary mechanisms of action or two complementary compounds or what have you with a relative proportionally lower side effect burden, although achieving similar actual efficacy outcomes. So by that, I mean terzepatide when you're looking at nausea proportional metrics, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, discontinuations to adverse events. It is lower in the, the terzepatide patients despite having as good or better weight loss metrics in these patients. And I believe it is because it has a dual effect where it has GIP receptor agonism as well as GLP-1 receptor agonism. So you have lower burden of side effects due to not leaning too far in the direction of one specific targeted receptor interaction, essentially. Like you have kind of two plus one plus one equals three effects, so to speak, with a drug that is essentially like doing two things at the same time. So terzepatide in general, Monjaro, better drug over Overall, but the same negative drawbacks exist nonetheless, which is the changes in heart rate seemingly, and also the lean body mass losses that are uh, concerning to say the least. So when I actually dug to look at some of the old GLP-1 receptor agonist data on some of the older iterations of these compounds like dulaglutide, um, exenatide, liraglutide, and then, you know, more recently semaglutide and even terzepatide. What we kind of see in general in the data is increases in about one to four beats per minute are pretty common seemingly in these individuals. And what I've seen personally is bumps upwards of five to 10 beats per minute. Here we have the Wegovy highlights of prescribing information document. And in here you can see indications and usage, dosage parameters, administration practices, contraindications, etc., drug interactions. And near the middle of the document, you can actually see the change in heart rate. Notable, mean increases in resting heart rate of one to four beats per minute were observed with routine clinical monitoring in Wegovy treated patients compared to placebo in clinical trials and trials in which patients were randomized prior to dose escalation. More patients treated with Wegovy compared with placebo had maximum changes from baseline at any visit of 10 to 19 beats per minute, 41% versus 34% percent respectively and 20 beats per minute or more 26 percent versus 16 percent respectively so again obviously this will vary person to person and obviously having a one to four beat per minute increase is not necessarily that scary but when you actually factor in that people are losing upwards of 10 15 20% of their body weight, like again, that was a Wegovy insert, so it wasn't representative of terzepatide, and maybe it wasn't a full, fair way to extrapolate out, you know, the dual GIP-GLP-1 
effects of terzepatide because again it could be better from a side effect burden aspect on the resting heart rate changes too but ultimately in these compounds we seem to see despite the fact that body weights are dropping by like 10 20 30 pounds increases in resting heart rate which is totally paradoxical to what you would think you would think the lower the burden on your heart like the less it would need to beat and i know there is you know debate as to what is actually a healthy resting heart rate and there are guys in like the ray pete community who would think that you know higher is better your more your metabolism's working better etc maybe that's not a fair <laughs> summary of exactly how, what they've said but i believe you know low resting heart rate has been frowned upon in that camp seemingly you have individuals who say as long as you're not over 100 and with tachycardia then you're going to be fine but there is data that suggests pretty strongly that the higher your resting heart rate the more representative of a increased risk in mortality early mortality there is like i think it's every five to ten beats per minute there's some significant change in what your projected date of dying would be it's troublesome and it's uh, sketchy and i would think anybody who is subjecting themselves to excessive uh stimulant abuse or anything that could otherwise speed up your heart rate to a degree that is closer to tachycardic territory is going to be sketchy and aside from the changes in heart rate, which are concerning when you're losing 20 plus pounds and having a bump in heart rate still, the lean body mass changes are something that absolutely need to be dissected further in my opinion and overseen with more scrutiny during therapy in my opinion for somebody who is otherwise using a GLP-1 agonist or a dual GIP GLP-1 like a terzepatide, Manjaro. DEXA scan is absolutely worthwhile and um, Peter is one of the few that I think is actually pushing this message to the forefront about why this is so such a cause for concern because if you end up just losing a disproportionately high amount of muscle it is not necessarily a net benefit despite the fact that you might be decreasing the intake of you know unhealthy foods that got you into a predicament where you have you know morbid obesity to begin with the problem with a compound like this is it suppresses your appetite very significantly to a point where a you might otherwise decrease your calorie intake so significantly that you're losing weight faster than you would have otherwise during a controlled dieting phase where you could otherwise proportionally preserve more lean tissue than during an aggressive cut like the more you crash diet the more you are setting yourself up to lose lean tissue ultimately like guys who are in the fitness industry know this and this is why natural bodybuilders will stagger out their cuts over the span of multiple months to have as minimal of a detrimental impact to their hormone production and lean muscle loss outcomes as possible because you don't want to lose any of the tissue you spent years upon building up like that is something that should be preserved and otherwise like held onto for dear life you don't want to lose your most mo metabolically active tissue that is what will keep you a capable human as you get into older age like keeping your muscle your bone integrity etc that is something that should be a given in anything that is causing you to give that up in some disproportionate manner or something that needs to be revisited and heavily evaluated like people who abuse the shit out of thyroid hormone to lose fat but then end up stripping a bunch of muscle off their frame at the same time like you're kind of missing you know what is the saying <laughs> you're like not seeing the the forest through the trees or whatever the saying is ultimately it's not good and when you have these compounds suppressing appetite so significantly in individuals who have diet practices that needed to be amended and significantly overhauled it could and seemingly does in some individuals almost exacerbate bad diet practices to the point where these individuals are now not only significantly chopping their calories down which again the net outcome for a lot of people is still going to be good but it is also putting them in a compromised position from another angle now whereby they are suppressing their hormones potentially through aggressive calorie cutting without even it being intentional sometimes because their appetite is so nuked at these mega doses of these glp1 receptor agonists or whatever so they're aggressively cutting weight faster than they should otherwise and in addition their diet practices had them eating very very hyper palatable foods that were otherwise not really conducive to great body compositions to begin with which is kind of where they got how they got to where they are presumably in the first place and now you are eating less of foods that you don't want probably and proportionally 
hitting your calories because you're barely hungry. So what are you going to eat? It's going to be the easiest thing that actually, you know, satisfies your hunger signaling. You might otherwise just end up eating like half your protein intake that you did when you were fat, but you are now just eating like only junk food, but it is at like 1500 calories instead of 3,500. Like that's not an uncommon outcome as some people that are now under eating, but under eating on the macronutrients that were otherwise preserving lean tissue at the same time too. So now they have inhibited hormone output and they are still eating shitty food. It's just less of it. So they are losing weight, but the net outcome of the weight loss is a proportional loss in lean body mass. Now, I do think that if proper attention is paid to diet quality during the deployment of these drugs and workout intensity, exercise regime, etc., then individuals can avoid this outcome entirely. The problem is the importance of it is not highlighted enough and the mechanism of it I don't think is properly elucidated. The people who are losing lots of weight, a lot of them have no idea what is actual being lost off their frame. Like Elon, I'm sure he has no fucking clue what his you know lean body mass losses were during that aggressive cutting phase. If you can even call it a cutting phase, it's like bodybuilder lingo. But individuals that have lost this weight, I'm sure a lot of them would be, uh, well, you know, maybe some of them wouldn't be totally horrified if they learned about the losses because they just see the number on the scale and they're thrilled. But if they knew what kind of consequence that could have on the back end, they really understood how important it was to preserve that lean tissue. More attention needs to be paid to the macronutrient intake during a cut still with these drugs is ultimately the takeaway. There are a lot of people out there taking these drugs that are essentially going down to like a protein deficient junk food calorie deficit and ending up in a state of skinny fat, whereby their health outcomes in some capacity may improve objectively by weight loss metric standards, but the amount of lean mass they've lost ultimately is not healthy. So this is something that I think the prescriber should be highlighting very, very prominently is diet quality. Regardless if you are suppressing your appetite to a degree which allows you to eat in a deficit to actually start going in the right direction of weight loss rather than gaining weight or sustaining some you know obesity level body composition just losing the weight is you know a step in the right direction but it has to be controlled ideally and modulated in a way that is favorable to an outcome that is still a net benefit from all health perspectives so having somebody hit their protein intake just because you have let's just assume the person who was some you know john doe is taking 2.4 milligrams of wego and he was eating 3,500 calories a day and he was like slowly gaining weight and he was in a you know state of you know obesity and he was hitting 150 grams of protein per day and he otherwise weighs, you know, 300 pounds or whatever. And, you know, he should be eating more protein and proportionally much less of the other shitty food. When he goes on Wego V, now he's able to go into, and again, maybe he wouldn't be at 3,500 calories if he was at 300 pounds. Like, I don't know, I'm just pulling an example out of my ass here. But some of these individuals, the reality is they're on a calorie surplus diet while eating like, I don't know, less than 100 grams of protein per day. And then they end up dropping in calories significantly to a point that they lose weight, but they are eating even less protein or their protein intake was subpar to begin with. And it is just reinforcing bad behavior patterns, but with a proportionally lower calorie burden and potentially even steering them in the direction of food that is easier and more desirable to consume from a palatability perspective because they barely have an appetite anymore. So they're barely hungry. They get not, like borderline nauseous from eating at some points, depending on the individual and how tolerable they are of the drug. So they're gonna eat something that is the easiest and most palatable thing to eat with a total zero concern for protein and diet quality at the end of the day. So while the drug can lead to these outcomes, and it does in many individuals, it is entirely avoidable. I think also on the other side of the coin, there are individuals who are quick to assume that this drug inherently has some muscle devastating properties when the reality of the situation is the drug itself is not detrimental to muscle tissue or good body composition outcomes. Rather, it is the effect it has on appetite, significantly suppressing it and reinforcing bad behaviors in individuals who probably had bad behaviors to begin with and potentially disproportionately pushing them in an even 
greater direction, a more polarized direction of bad behavior, but just with a lower calorie burden now to a point where they can lose weight, but the overall diet proportions inside of that calorie content are actually even less healthy. You know, obviously calories at the end of the day is the thing that dictates weight loss or weight gain. So you could argue that, you know, until we're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, these individuals, despite the fact that they're losing weight, they could otherwise offset their losses in lean body mass pretty significantly if they were able to either stagger their weight loss and actually be more calculated about how quick they lose it. And obviously if you're morbidly obese, you can be a bit more aggressive than the next guy. You know, in general, people who are using these drugs aren't going to be people in the fitness industry who are like 15 to 20% body fat. But also aside from the aggressive weight loss, it's also the going proportionally away from protein and micronutrient density foods, dense foods, and going towards the direction of things that are more palatable, more, I don't know, desirable to consume, but aren't necessarily nutritious and allowing body composition to spiral in a negative direction. Despite the fact that you're losing a bunch of weight, if you're skinny fat, it's still not necessarily good. So I think as long as protein intake that is sufficient for muscle preservation is maintained during these weight loss phases during exposure to GLP-1 receptor agonists or dual agonists and proper exercise is maintained and resistance training, the weight loss can otherwise be representative of healthy weight loss that has a proportional loss of lean body mass relative to fat mass that is actually healthy. You just need to be more careful about the staggering of it, ideally, and also the quality of the diet itself on the way down. And more attention needs to be drawn to it because I do think there is a lot of benefit to be had from these drugs potentially, but also consideration for how to optimize your path towards those outcomes. You don't want to go from fat to skinny fat. Ideally, you just want to go from <laughs> fat to like good body composition. And like that would be fantastic. You want to be able to become insulin sensitive and ideally as muscular and viral and or virile. I don't know how you would say it, pronounce it exactly, but somebody who otherwise has a good muscle focused physique and it doesn't mean you need to be jacked by the end of the use of this stuff or whatever, but individuals who are obese and just letting, you know, the relative, you know, low amounts of muscle mass that they had to begin with go down the toilet and becoming emaciated skinny fat individuals who also have like shit hormones and whatnot just for the sake of, you know, losing the pounds. Both scenarios are not necessarily great. Being obese as hell or skinny fat and emaciated, more attention needs to be drawn to the effects of these drugs and how they interact with the body and how to go about optimizing your way down in the weight loss journey. Because if you don't follow the good diet practices that would otherwise have allowed a person to get lean and healthy without the drug, even with the drug, you are just exacerbating the bad habits potentially and otherwise leading to these, the prevalency of these, uh, you know, skinny fat outcomes. So I'm actually curious who's overseeing Elon's stuff and what they tell him. That'd be interesting because it doesn't even sound like, or as of maybe more recently, he is, you know, more rigorous about, you know, adhering to a regular exercise regimen, but he is still crediting vast majority of his results to just not eating in Wegovy. And that would be a primary example of somebody who probably could have optimized his weight loss journey far better if he was aware of how detrimental it could be to just lose a fuck ton of weight with complete disregard for the other stuff. You know, he's a smart guy, so I'm sure he's had this kind of relayed to him and whatnot, but you never know. Sometimes even the guys at the top of the top who are highly intelligent will completely overlook something that you and I might think is obvious, and then vice versa for something they're an expert on, we're like completely fucking inept on, and they think we're idiots. So, I don't know. At the end of the day, he is losing weight. A lot of people are on the bandwagon of, you know, the GLP-1 hype. And I just think more people need to monitor diet quality on the way down and also be considerate of some of these potentially overlooked side effects like the heart rate increases are not something to ignore and are, to me, something that I hope to be elucidated further because I would want to know why is it something that is 
pushing your sympathetic nervous system into overdrive a bit? Is it what is going on here? Is it some sort of ghrelin receptor interaction response, kind of similar to an MK, but on the opposite, when I say MK, ibutamoran, but it's on the opposite side of the spectrum. Like we saw some of those ghrelin receptor agonist studies where you had like rodents getting induced with PTSD essentially from chronic ghrelin receptor agonism. Is there some sort of like interaction with that response feedback system that is happening with the GLP-1 agonists that also interact with satiety feedback signals that is cranking up resting heart rate. Like, I don't really know, but it is uh, concerning and should at least be noted and considered before you just jump on this shit. So, and again, I think the more frequent dosing protocols, it sucks how it's not possible with these actual like pharma pens seemingly, but I think that could be something that definitely attenuates the side effect burden to a fair degree, at least when it comes to some of these, you know, like GI distress metrics and whatnot. I don't know how impactful it would be on the heart rate metrics, but I imagine having your influx of drug on one day, every single, like once a week with these, mega doses would definitely push your heart rate more in the direction of you know being synthetically spiked versus if this was kind of uh bled out throughout the week in a more even distribution pattern so anyways just something to consider thought i'd make a video about it something i've seen uh, talked about more prevalently and i think some attention needs to be paid to it so anyways hopefully you guys enjoyed it let me know what you guys think in the comments down below have you you know, had any experience with this stuff? Do you know anybody who's on it? What were their experiences like? Any and all comments help you algorithm them. They're much appreciated. And the more insight we have on this stuff, the better. And if anybody knows the, you know, mechanism by which the heart rate changes happen, that'd be interesting for me to know as well. Like there are some studies that attempt to dissect out exactly what's going on. Like this one was discussing acute exenatide and 12 week glutide administration and some of the effects on resting heart rate. If it's affecting sympathetic drive was what I just said a second ago, or decrease in parasympathetic activity. I mean, it's augmenting resting heart rates. Second hypothesis is vascular resistance reductions activating homeostatic baroreflex mechanisms. Any more conclusive data that is more recent would be great to see as well if you could drop it down. And if you guys can subscribe, apparently there's like a 50% to 50% ratio or something. It might even be less than that. It might be like 55 that watch my videos are not subscribed or are subscribed. I don't remember, but either way, a lot of people who watch aren't subscribed and it really helps the channel when you guys subscribe. Um, it tells YouTube to, you know, push my stuff to new audience and whatnot. And it's very much appreciated when you guys do. So if you could drop a sub, like the video really helps. And it also, you know, puts me in your sub box. So you can actually see when I post. So if you want to see uh, more stuff like this, you know, that's how I'll know you guys are interested. It's the uh, subscriber to view ratios, especially are very indicative of content that I will lean into harder. So if you guys like this content, you know, definitely subscribe. So I'll know. And um, if you guys want to uh, support me, anything in the video description below helps. And notably, if you're going to be using compounds like this, having a provider on your side that understands some of the very nuanced mechanisms as well as uh, considerations when it comes to side effect profile, um, having provider in your camp that is very vetted in GLP-1 receptor agonist literature and actual practical implementation in patients. We have many providers at Merrick Health who are very, very experienced with overseeing patients who use these compounds. So I would definitely recommend you know, obviously Merrick Health is my company that I would highly recommend you check out if you want to get high quality medical oversight for stuff like this, but also just to, you know, check your diagnostics and see from a preventative medicine standpoint, how you could otherwise get dialed in. You know, that's just a shameless plug. Um, talking about my stuff in the video description, anything else down there helps support me. And that was just a relevant one for the subject matter. So, you know, if you guys want to check it out, all my blood test panels and providers that work with us are all on that platform. And it's a great service, in my opinion. So you can check it out and um, definitely recommend you get a quality provider regardless, even if it's elsewhere. So anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed that one and I will talk to you guys soon.